wat hier gebeur het, is iets wat nooit ooit moes wees he, en iets wat nooit ooit weer moet gebeur he. Maar ons weet ons, ons hoop is amper in wijn. Ons weet amper dat gaan weer gebeur. Dat is die hartseerste van alles. Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me here again today. So last week we spoke about the case of David Mbengwa and if you haven't seen that I will link it up here. But he was most well known for being the Lovers Lane killer. So I'll link that up here for you if you want to give it a watch. But in today's case we are talking about innocent life that was taken for absolutely poor motives. And for this case I do just want to give a warning, it is very graphic and very disturbing so please just be mindful of that when watching this video. And with that being said, Said, and my warning put out there let's get into today's case intended for mature audiences only so for our case today we are in sunny south africa and in the beautiful province of the western cape and particularly in an area called paul and if you have ever been to paul you will know it is absolutely stunning with the rolling hills the vineyards and the crisp agricultural air paul is a beautiful beautiful town so to start things off, let's talk about the mom and dad of this family. The mom of this family was named Magdalene Klaassen and the dad of this family was named Sean Levies and they were parents to Shaman Monique Klaassen and her younger sister who will not be named. Shaman Monique had an older half-sister as well as an older half-brother from her mom's side. So Magdalene had two children from a previous relationship. Both Shaman Monique's half-brother and half-sister lived on the same property as them but not in the same house. So when I say they lived on the same property, Magdalene and Sean obviously were in a relationship with their two children and they lived in a Wendy house on this property. And a Wendy house is like a very small, generally a wooden structure which is often used to store things but can often also be turned into a small house. But I mean small. So basically Magdalene and Sean lived in the small Wendy house and then Shan Monique's half-sister lived in another building on this property and her half-brother lived I think in the main house. And besides the Wendy house on this property there was also a storeroom but there was the main house on this property. And in the main house lived Magdalene's aunt. So Magdalene's aunt basically owned this whole property and then her family lived on the same property with her in order to curb costs and just to have her family close as well. Shamonique's family struggled financially quite a lot and they often would work from hand to mouth most months. And Magdalene and Sean often had seasonal work or agricultural work where there was only really things happening in certain seasons and they would have to wait for a couple of months before they would get work again. So money was often very tight for certain months and then there would be money in other months but there was not a lot to cover every single expense so they weren't well off basically from the work that they were doing. But even though there was not much money in the family there was an abundance of love. Shan Monique, her little sister, her half siblings and her mom and dad were an incredibly close unit. They shared everything together, they were very close, they talked almost every night not only because they lived on the same property but because they wanted to know about each other's day, they wanted to know how things were going and they just wanted to make sure that they were okay, happy and healthy. Shan Monique also loved school, she was very academically inclined and she was just a bright positive light that even her teachers really loved having in the class. They would say that Shan Monique was often very responsible so if the teacher would leave the class they would often ask her to look after the class, kind of be the class captain and she thrived on this kind of responsibility even in her young years. Shan Monique was also very popular at school and she did have a lot of friends as well. And Shan Monique had incredible aspirations when she grew up she knew what kind of life she was living. She knew that her family didn't have a lot of money. They didn't come from abundance of wealth. And she also knew that she couldn't afford what her classmates could afford. She wasn't able to have what they had. But Shan Monique was incredibly happy and proud of where she come from. She was proud of her family. She was proud of where her parents were, how much they were working, how much effort they put every day to put food on the table. And she was proud of her working class family, even from such a young age. And she would often say to her mom, Mom, I'm proud of you. Mom, I'm happy. And one day I'm going to be famous and I'm going to be able to give you the house that you've always wanted to give us. Shan Monique also saw a lot of TV and she saw this beautiful woman on TV. And one day she went up to her mom and she said, that's how I'm going to make you some money. I want to become a model. 
So like I said, because there wasn't a lot of funds that were just floating around, Magdalene had to try and find the funds to give Chamonique what she wanted. And they really wanted to try and pursue this modeling career because Chamonique really wanted it. So with the little funds that they had and a lot of help from the neighbors, Magdalene and Sean were able to put a dress together, to put lots of makeup together and to put Chamonique on a beautiful photo shoot. And they took a lot of beautiful photos of her. So remember I said that Chamonique had an older half sister and an older half brother. Well, the older half sister, and the reason why I'm not calling her by her name is because she was not named in this case. That's why I'm not calling her by her name. But basically, Chamonique's half-sister had a boyfriend named Jerome America. And Jerome America came from a very harsh, very strict upbringing. His parents were very strict and there was not a lot of love between them either. They got divorced quite early in Jerome's upbringing and they separated. And throughout Jerome's childhood, he would spend most of his time with his mother. But once he became a teenager, he then went and lived with his father. And as soon as Jerome did go and live with his father, he ended up leaving school. So Jerome left school at about 13. 14 years old when he was in grade 7 and the reason that Jerome said that he did leave school was because he said that he couldn't concentrate on it anymore there was too much going on at home and it just wasn't for him so Jerome and Chamonique's half-sister met in 2012 and they started dating almost immediately but I'm just going to be blunt and say that Jerome was an absolute piece of work in this relationship firstly he was always high he was in and out of prison constantly for theft, for burglary, for robbing this person or whatever it was, he was in and out of prison for. And then a couple of weeks into Jerome and Chamonix's half-sister's relationship, she ended up falling pregnant and Jerome carried on with his ways. He was not there in any way to support her at all through her pregnancy. And basically as soon as Chamonix's half-sister had given birth to her baby daughter, Jerome went off the bandwagon and he became incredibly abusive. And then by the beginning of 2013, Chamonix's half-sister had then taken out a restraining order on Jerome. And I mean, that was, what, a whirlwind of one year from falling pregnant to having a baby and to taking out a restraining order on your then-boyfriend. But sadly, she did eventually go back to Jerome. And she went back to him because he had convinced her that she had now changed and that he had stopped taking drugs. He was a good person. He was going to be a good father. And she believed him. But just like before and not long after they got back together, Jerome started smacking her around again, hitting her with anything and everything that he could find. But then in 2015, Chamonix's half-sister was back at home and she was actually in the main house of the house where her parents and everyone stayed on. So she was in the main house with her aunt. And in the main house is the main telephone which Chamonix's half-sister was then talking to Jerome on. So then Chamonix's half-sister hung up the phone because she had had enough of Jerome and she was done talking to him. And just before she had hung up, Jerome had said that if you don't get back with me, I'm going to come and make sure that you do. Then a couple of minutes later, you hear knocking at the door and there's Jerome with a massive axe and he comes rushing into the house and straight for Chamonix's half-sister. Their baby is now crying, and Jerome then pauses. He sees his daughter crying and absolutely terrified of her father with an axe, and then he turns around and runs away. And then the next day, after this incredibly terrifying incident happened, Chamonix's half-sister was on her way to work. And while she was busy walking to work, Jerome then walked up behind her and hit her at the back of the head with something really hard. She then stumbled and fell to the floor and when she turned around, Jerome was standing over her and he then said to her, oh, we're going to have sex now. She did try and fight back, but it was absolutely futile because Jerome was quite strong and he also had a massive axe in his hand. He then took her between the bush and the railway tracks where he then had sex with her. And then once he was done, he then grabbed her by the arm and dragged her towards the river bend where they then had sex again by force, mind you. And once Jerome was done again, he then said to Chamonix's half-sister, they need to get back together. And if they don't, if he can't have her, no one can. And he said that he was going to murder her right then and there if she didn't agree to get back with him. And I'm sure like many people in this situation, she lied straight up to his face and she was like of course I'll get back with you and she said but I will only get back with you if you stop taking drugs so Jerome kind of thought about it and he was like okay I'll stop taking drugs and then they both parted their separate ways 
she walked back home to her mom Magdalene and she told her everything that happened in the bush and by the river. Magdalene did really recommend that she go to the police and she tell the police everything that happened. And what makes me really sad about this case is that there were murmurings and whispers that were going on around the community because word had spread about what happened between Jerome and Shamonique's half-sister. And basically they were going on about how they were in a relationship and that she was lying and that basically she couldn't really claim and go to the police because they were in a relationship. So if he wanted it, she couldn't claim that it was real. And it wasn't rape because they had a baby together and they just got out of a relationship. And obviously, if you hear it like this, it is incredibly infuriating because no means no. And if he is holding an axe to your face and forcing you to have sex, it is obviously rape. But it is quite sad that some people in the community did take Jerome's side. But sadly, that is the case with a lot of these kind of assaults. But that is completely besides the point. But basically, Shamonique's half-sister did end up going to the police and she did get a restraining order on Jerome America. And this time she got a permanent restraining order, which means that it can't fall away after a certain period or a couple of months. But even though she did have this restraining order against Jerome, I don't think that a piece of paper was going to stop him. And sadly, no, he did not leave her alone. He was constantly texting her, constantly calling her, constantly harassing her saying that they need to get back together, he has changed, and also saying that she has a restraining order on him and that she doesn't have a restraining order on him seeing his child. And eventually, Shamonique's half-sister believed him and they eventually met up and started talking again and then they got back together. So basically, Shamonique's half-sister and Jerome now are in a relationship again and they ended up staying on the same property as Magdalene, Sean, Shamonique and Magdalene's aunt in the main house and also Shamonique's little sister. So they were all on the same property now and Shamonique's half-sister and Jerome slept in a storeroom at the back of the property. And then in early February of 2016, Jerome and Shamonique's half-sister were busy fighting again and eventually she had had enough and she then took their daughter and went to stay with one of her relatives on a farm, also in Paul, but they just needed the space. But then on Saturday the 27th of February 2016, Magdalene and Sean were then planning to go on a shopping trip. They needed to get a few things for the house. So they then left Shamonique and her younger sister with their aunt in the main house. So Shamonique was independent from the day she was born and she was ready to do everything herself. And just like I assume she had done plenty of times before, Shamonique got up early that morning. She made herself some breakfast and then she kind of was just in a lazy mood and she went back to bed, watched some TV and eventually fell asleep again. So like I said, Magdalene's aunt was busy looking after the two children. So because Shamonique had fallen asleep in the Wendy house, the aunt then took Shamonique's younger sister and went across the road to their neighbor's house. And let me just describe the neighbor's house to you. So basically, when you sat on the stoop of the neighbor's house, you could see the Wendy house where Shamonique slept without any obstructions. So it was just a clear view. There was nothing in the way, no trees, no gates, nothing. It was open gates and just a road. So while the aunt and her friend, the neighbor, are sitting on the stoop with the baby in arm, they are busy eating biscuits, drinking tea, and the aunt keeps noticing that Jerome goes in and out of the Wendy house all the time. So eventually the aunt was like, mm, something's not right here. So she then picks up the baby and then she heads back over to the Wendy house. So she opens the Wendy house door and she sees that Shamonique is still asleep. So she puts Shamonique's younger sister next to her and they're both sleeping. Then when the aunt leaves the Wendy house, she closes the door and she's about to turn around the corner of the Wendy house when Jerome then like intercepts her and he asks for some money and some bread. And the aunt was like, I don't have any spare change to give you, but I can gladly give you some food in the house. So they then walk to the main house and the aunt then gives Jerome some bread. She then sees Jerome leave the property and then head towards the street and towards the direction of the shops. So the aunt then finishes up whatever she was doing in her house. I think she may have been grabbing some food as well. And then she leaves her house, locks the door, then heads towards the Wendy house to check on the children again. She opens the door to the Wendy house and she notices the baby is still there, or the toddler, but now Shamonique is missing. She's nowhere to be seen. So now everyone is full panic stations because now this young girl is missing. So Magdalene and Sean get home and they hit the ground running. 
both of them start looking in cupboards, looking under tables, looking in corners, looking in boxes, anywhere they are looking. They then left the property to try and search the streets and they also went to hospitals but could not find Shamwanik anywhere. After they went to the hospital, they then went to the police station where they then put out a full Amber Alert for Shamwanik. Then a police report was created to try and find this young missing girl on the 28th of February 2016 which was actually Shamwanik's birthday and she would have then been 11 years old. And the family didn't really want to believe that they wouldn't find their daughter again. They really had hope that maybe she was just at a neighbor's house, something may have gone wrong but their daughter was still alive. So they then asked Jerome, well the aunt actually asked Jerome, before they were going to head out and do foot patrols on the street to try and find Shamonique, that he start frying some meat so that they could come home with Shamonique and actually have a birthday party for her. And because Shamonique's half-sister, remember, was staying at the farm with her family relative, she had heard about Shamonique being missing and she instantly came back to try and help in the search as well. But eventually the families were continuously looking for Shamonique, they couldn't find anything and with bloodshot, crying eyes, all of Shamonique's loved ones all rested their heads in their beds, but still tossing and turning as they worried about where Shamonique would be and where she could have gone. But during the night when all was still and Shamonique's relatives were all sleeping in their beds, Shamonique's sister, who remember was in a relationship with Jerome and sleeping in the storeroom, she kept tossing and turning the entire night. And she kept tossing and turning because she said to Jerome, she kept waking him up, and she said, Jerome, there's a smell, there's something in this room, it smells like something died in here. And Jerome kept saying, oh shush, it's just a mouse, just go back to sleep. And she couldn't, she couldn't get over the smell in the room. So then on Monday, remember Shamonique went missing on a Saturday. So the Monday, the entire family started making more missing person flyers. And they had then printed an entire handful of massive bunch of them. And they then went back to the house to start distributing it between different family members. And when the aunt went into her main house, she had this like massive hit of something that really smelt and they couldn't find where it was. And in their minds at the time, they didn't really think of it. They were like a dead mouse is the last thing they really care about right now. And they carried on unpacking all their flyers and sorting things out. Then a couple of hours later, Jerome then went to the aunt and he's like, can I please have a handful of flyers? I want to go and put some out in the street. So the aunt was like, yeah, sure, of course you can. And she then handed him some flyers and then Jerome then left the property. And then the aunt started walking around her kitchen again and she's like, something really stinks in this house. So she then called over Shamonique's half-brother to then try and find the source of the smell. So he then starts walking around the house. Like I said, he was in the main house and he then starts going through each bedroom and he hones in on one of the bedrooms and he cannot get over the smell. He has to cover his nose, but then he looks under the bed and he notices a couple of rubbish bags and he thinks maybe a couple of mice got in here and they have now died. So he pulls the bags out from the under the bed and he then takes one black bag off of this bunch of black bags and then he realizes that there's a blanket inside this bag and it's all tied up so he unties the string that's wrapped around this blanket and he then sadly uncovers the body of his young half-sister Shamonique. Shamonique had been wrapped in a blanket which had been tightly tied with rope with then a plastic bag covering her face. She was then placed into bigger black bags and then shoved under one of the beds inside the bedroom. And I do just want to point out that in the month of February in South Africa, it is a scorcher. It is absolutely boiling. And later on, the pathologist would say that Shamonique's decomposition was so advanced in these three days that she was unrecognizable. But when police were called and they were having a look at everything, the aunt actually managed to take a glance at Shamonique's body and she noticed the blanket that she was wrapped in and she immediately went to the police. She then said to the police that that blanket that Shamonique was wrapped in is not the blanket allocated to that room. Apparently that blanket belongs to Jerome in his bedroom. The next day, police then took cadaver dogs back to Shamonique's location where she was found, and they wanted the dogs to sniff the entire property to see if this was the place that she was murdered or if they could find any other evidence in the house. And when the dogs arrived on the property, they obviously went to the room where her body was found, but they also made a beeline for Jerome's bedroom. So anywhere that these cadaver dogs are sniffing is where a dead body or something that had died has been. So when they went into Jerome's bedroom, they found traces of blood 
and they also found traces of human bodily fluids. And then police had dug a little bit further into the storeroom where it was piled with boxes at the back of the storeroom. So police thought, mm, let's just kind of have a look. They started removing all of the boxes and basically behind these boxes was empty space. And in this empty space, they found more human bodily fluids, a knife covered in blood, and also a broken monitor for a PC or like a small screen. So I do just want to give you a warning for the next part. It's incredibly graphic and incredibly disturbing. So please just keep that in mind when listening to this next part. So Chamonique's body was taken for autopsy because her cause of death was undetermined at the time that she was found. And the pathologist that handled Chamonique's body at the time and who did her autopsy, she said that the amount of decomposition on Chamonix's body was incredibly advanced, like we said earlier. And this was one, because she was wrapped in a blanket, because it was February and it was absolutely boiling that weekend, and because she was tucked under a bed in a closed room. So none of the windows were open either. But she also noticed that Chamonix had been murdered and then wrapped in this blanket and then put in the black bags. But then she also noticed that someone had then removed the black bags taken off the blanket and then put it back on again. And the pathologist suggested that the place that Chamonique was found in this room in the main house was not the place that she was murdered. And in the moving of her body, once she was first wrapped, may have dislodged some of the wrapping and the rope and that's why some things had come loose. And also because things had come loose, mice were actually biting at her fingertips. The pathologist also determined that Chamonique had been hit with something incredibly heavy, so she had incredible damage to the side of her skull. She also had been stabbed, but ultimately her cause of death was strangulation. And sadly, Chamonique had been raped both by Chamonique and Ellie. And Jerome America was arrested days after the pathologist's report was released, and he was then taken to prison. And Jerome was then tried for the murder of Chamonique Clarsen. And Jerome America actually faced seven charges against him, which included Chamonix's half-sister's encounter with Jerome. Remember that time that he had had his way with her by the railway tracks and by the river? The police actually asked if they could combine both of these cases to put an even harsher sentence on Jerome. And she agreed and she said that they could put both of them together. So that's why he faced so many different charges. So Jerome America was charged with two counts of kidnapping, one for kidnapping Chamonique and one for kidnapping Chamonique's half-sister. He was also charged on four counts of rape, two counts of rape on Chamonique's half-sister and two counts of rape against Chamonique. Jerome America was also charged with one count of murder for Chamonique Clarsen. And the state actually had no physical evidence of proving that Jerome America had actually done this to Chamonix. But there was so much circumstantial evidence that it was very difficult not to blame him for doing this. The state also believed that the amount of circumstantial evidence was so much and so abundant that they didn't believe that anyone else could have done it. Jerome America was found guilty to all seven charges against him. And it was quite interesting to read the court documents about this case because Jerome had actually had a defense for why he said that he raped Chamonix's half-sister that day at the railroad and the river. And he said that he didn't count it as rape because he said that she took off her clothes. So it didn't count because she did that. It was up to her to do that. Even though he was the one holding the axe and threatening to murder her, because she took off her clothes by herself, she was obviously asking for it, basically. And the judge was incredibly offended by the statement. And he actually said to Jerome that that is an incredibly disgusting way to think about it. And because Jerome America refused to talk about what he did, he still pleads not guilty to this case. However, the prosecution believes that the day that Chamonique was murdered, Jerome had gone to the shop before and bought a lot of sweets. He then lured Chamonique into his room with the sweets. And once she had gotten into the room, he then took the PC monitor and hit her over the back of the head, where she then fell unconscious. He then had sex with her twice. And then he stabbed her because he didn't want her to wake up and tell everyone what he had done. And then when he noticed that the stab wound in her chest didn't kill her, he then put his hand over her throat and he strangled her to death. And it kind of makes you wonder if he was planning this all along and maybe if he was just waiting for the right opportunity to do this, which I kind of have a feeling he did because it was basically the perfect moment for him to do it. No one was at home. He saw that the aunt had left the property. He was either incredibly opportunistic 
or like I said, he had planned this for quite a while. But that is the incredibly horrific and tragic case of Shamoni Clarkson. Let me know what you think down below. I hope that everyone is staying safe. Thank you for all your support and I'll see you again next week. Bye.